idea. I mean, because we are all waiting for because we have. <laughs> Um, so our next presenter is um, Ernesto Schwartz Marin from Dar no from University of Exeter, uh, who's going to be talking about hydro hydraulic democracy from the Euro Sintetica to crime mapping sequester in Mexico. Okay, so you, you should ask and with um, oh. So you should ask me why I'm linking an indigenous population that lives in Lake Titicaca with crime mapping sequestro. And this is the, the thing that I'm going to try to answer in like two minutes. And the whole thing is that um, how this started. Well, Connor and I had this idea of putting together the grant in around, I think, 2015. It was the first meeting. A so while ago. A while ago. Um, and one of the things that we encountered in our previous research was that 73% of disappearances start as kidnappings. So Arely and I had this research called citizen-led forensics, which was about creating a, a, a different sort of DNA database, and also citizens recording their own disappearances, telling us a narrative. And it was very clear that kidnapping was linked with disappearance. And Connor and I was dis were discussing how we could mix citizen-led science, which is kind of like the, the brand of these Marxist citizen science projects with the idea of kidnapping. And we had we developed some tools. And as any good story, this story starts with failure, or I'd rather say in academic terms, partial success. Okay? <laughs> and the failure was that when the project came to an end, we had created this beautiful parliament of national leaders of disappearance, uh, some of which you you had interviewed or maybe you have seen in the in the movie of yesterday, which I could recognize two or three there. And the parliament worked as much as we had money and time to devote to making this political community active. But of course, when the funding ended, the parliament shattered and everyone went back to their places and to their local politics, which Pretty much you could say that it was obvious that it would happen, but we didn't know a part of the project was to see if they continued doing that kind of national parliamentary work. And um, very briefly, let me tell you what is the team. Um, so it's, we are funded by the Newton Fund, and leads an exeter, lead on the kind of the co-investigator thing, and then we have uh, Tecnológico de Monterrey, Laboratorio de Justicia Social, or uh, Investigación Social, and Masia, which are the three local partners that help us develop the whole project, the participatory project. As you know, it's not the same to do ethnography that do participatory action research, which means lots more work, organization calls, uh, budgets, contracts. We have been dealing with lots of contracts. Um, we're, still with <laughs> we're still dealing with that and payments. So we need a, a bigger team to make that happen. And fortunately, after a lot of interesting anecdotes, I can tell you, um, we now have one. Um, anyway, so what I'm going to tell you is based, roughly, uh, although I'm not going to show you all the data, on 56 interviews, OK? And um, another four that we made with um, um, youngsters that are in conflict with the law, that means that they were involved in kidnapping people in, in Mexico City. Um, and we have civil society, collectives, activists, victims. Uh, the whole thing is that we didn't want to repeat the same set of interviews and ethnography we had in citizen-led forensics. So all these interviews are actually with people that we, we don't know. Okay, that's, that's something that was key for us because we spent a year working with families of the disappeared, many, many of which actually have great experiences of kidnapping. As you can see with, with Areli, Leti Roy, many of the people that are at the forefront of the fight. So we didn't want to do the usual thing that uh, academics do, that speak with the same people they know and comfortable with. Um, so it was a titanic task, to say the least, to actually do that because it, it brings another layer of difficulty. You, what happens with academics is we tend to speak with the same people. So Segueda, right? How, how many here we have interviewed in Segueda? Raise your hand. OK, beautiful. Yeah, you see, that's exactly what we wanted to avoid. And it was hard. It was a hard job, just to let you know. And, um, and this is based, the, the, the whole thing that I'm going to tell you today is based in uh, the idea of Peter Sloterdijk, pneumatic de democracy. And this is kind of a joke. So Peter Sloterdijk, which is my favorite philosopher, by the way, uh, second to Hannah Arendt only, um, has this idea, this, um, it's an installation, art installation, in which he's sending agoras to places that lack democratic values. And it's kind of a joke about this idea that we can export democracy, or that civil society is never violent, or that society has some kind of like key patterns and features. Uh, 
Anyway, the whole idea of the, of the nomadic parliament gave me the idea to think about why, why are we producing our political organization around parliaments? My own experience with parliaments are really costly to keep. They need a moderator, which in my case was me, and that burnt in my face when I had to leave. And the speaker, we can see that in Brexit. What, how problematic is this? <laughs> so why do we think about parliaments? This, this is not something else out there. We talk about this decolonial politics, blah, 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 but we still think of parliaments democracy boring. Not only boring, but not efficient, even for the modern standards. And actually, this is, is not the best way to think about how to do participatory action research and even democratic processes in, in countries such as Mexico, where this trust is so deep that even governmental organizations do not share their DNA. Okay, so our project was actually a response to this thing. That is not that Mexico lacks DNA or the technologies, it's that we distrust each other so deeply that we don't want to share that data. Um, anyway, so it, it starts with failure and it still can fail. The other thing I have to tell you that this is just uh, something we're experimenting with right now. Uh, let me explain you why the Uros are our inspiration. The Uros uh, are an com indigenous community that lives in floating islands made of reed in Lake Titicaca. So whenever they marry, they come together and they sow their islands to each other and they grow and they, it's like a tourist attraction. And it's a whole ecological governance system. Actually, they were messed up when the state wanted to intervene. But before, before the state wanted to intervene on their liquid territoriality, they managed really well the conflict. Um, I knew I have, to, I have to thank my colleague Michael, uh, who was the first that, that told me about this. I didn't know about the Urus until I was like a postgrad, and I, I'm very ashamed because of that. Uh, but Michael Kent was the one that introduced me. And ever since I heard about this, um, I thought like that's, that's a fantastic way of governance. It, it actually reflects kinship rather than these abstract ideas about the state, okay? So I was fascinated and, and this is kind of also a way to think through the Uros way of governance. Um, so to make it clear, we hate the definition of kidnapping as exists today for two reasons. One is that it's utterly or reflexive. So, privación ilegal de la libertad, which is what you were kind of translating there. I don't know what would be the translation in English. Uh, <laughs> is basically anyone can grab you, and that's privación ilegal de la libertad. And kidnapping means something, according, if you're a right-wing NGO or a left-wing NGO, you're right-wing, it means someone asked for a ransom. Someone has to pick up the phone, send a messenger, and tell you to give them money. If not, it's not kidnapping. Actually, the law tells you what are the, the levels of um, different kidnapping, which basically includes everything, okay? So that's another way in which you could say law is weaponized for the interest of the few, okay? And these, these few are really interested in making kidnapping as narrow as possible, okay? Because then they say the police can work on it. Mm -hmm. It means that it can only work on elite kidnappings. It means it can only work on extorted kidnappings. And probably that doesn't match at all with the conflict scenario in Mexico. I think we, we, we have a real problem with that. And I'm going to give you some numbers you cannot see as well, so you can enjoy. Um, and basically, this is the, the something I'm just going to skip because we don't have the time. And after kind of bringing the numbers, and there's a huge on the reporting, we, in these interviews, we, we made a typology of what is kidnapping and how it's linked with other crimes. So actually, kidnapping, uh, the one that we are always thinking of is extortive kidnapping, which is here. But enforced disappearance, pretty much it's also kidnapping, okay? And according to our project, we, we can show that in at least the reports, the 473 families that reported it as kidnapping, which is one of the key aspects of citizen-led forensics. It's the only database that has narratives of how people disappeared, according to the investigations of the mothers themselves. So thinking through this, uh, we actually look at it in this way. This is I don't know if you know this, but the Sequestro Express is also called a Mexican kidnapping uh, because it's made by policemen while they're shi changing their shift. So they cannot be prosecuted. So they have seven hours to do the whole thing. And, the, and they always take the, the information of the people they kidnapped so they can keep um, amenazándolos, okay? So I know where you live. And that's exactly why the express kidnapping is uh, so effective. And it's mainly done by policemen. 
Um, and I can tell you horror stories, but this is not the point of this presentation. Uh, we have a collection of those, uh, very detailed. Oh, this is beautiful. So um, something went wrong with my PowerPoint. OK, so just very quickly. So I, wanna, I wanted to show you. These are four technologies we're developing based on these 56 interviews. And I had different quotes that now are something I don't recognize. Uh, <laughs> but, but <laughs> yes, the, my, my, my presentation is kidnapped. Uh, but anyway, this co basically what we're doing is a comic book that is, is going to serve as a manual of what's going on with kidnapping. And the whole story, the narrative is based on the 56 interviews that we have gathered. So it's, it's, a, it's a fictional story based on real kidnapping stories. So people can start developing their own security strategies. And this is, uh, Connor and I started this project with a simple question, which is, what do you do to fight kidnapping when you cannot trust the state? This is the simple question we are trying to solve. And to do this participation research uh, project, then we thought we needed a, a kind of like family of technologies that with, based on this period of citizen-led technologies are produced with the people we are ethnographically working with, okay? So we, we always start the technologies from scratch. That's one of the key elements of what we do. And um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about, about the architecture. As you uh, know, this is basically a replication, a digital replication of the Uros Island, okay? So actually this is a, a fantastic way to think about governance in the digital age. Why do we need to comply with the terms of reference and conditions of Facebook or social media and the likes? That means that we have to already accept a preset uh, condition of what is our, uh, our freedoms and possibilities. So this whole idea is to change that because kidnapping, as, as we were talking, actually attacks intimacy, monetizes intimacy. And connectivity is one of those ways in which you can generate not compressed intimacy. Al although this was not our idea at the beginning. This is now more a theoretical thing that is coming out of the, of the interviews. And what we want to do with this app is to replicate the whole floating islands um, ideas. So it has a registry, so you can independently register your kidnappings or the kidnappings of the people you love. And also have a, a bitacora of security, right? Of near misses of events that happen and a post event. And then a panic button. Panic buttons are mainly useless. But in case you're actually also witnessing something, you can push the panic button and record and it goes to your database. Um, and there's, of course, your referencing and so on and so forth. But probably the most interesting bit is how you produce these floating islands. And these floating islands are produced through direct voting. So you have to invite the people you trust. Um, I'm going to run until. Uh, I explain you this. This is actually another innovation because most of the way in which we decide what's happening in the data world today is through verification. So Amnesty International or other NGOs try to verify the events, which is costly, needs a structure. And what we do is that we are supposing that because you're sharing information with the ones you love and care for, the information is going to be more truthful, right? So we are ex we're being parasitic on kinship and love to bring a bit, of, a bit of truthfulness to the, to the idea of uh, sharing data. Um, and then, <coughs> once you decide who's your network and how you're gonna take decisions, this is the key technology. People would think that the key technology of the project is the app. The app is just a hook for millennials, like me and you and some other people. But actually, the key technology of the project is to make security planning. Because another beauty of our ethnography is that people, even people that have disappear family members, do not want to talk about security planning. Porque hablar de eso es llamarlo. So there's this inherent fear about making these plans. Um, so with all that in mind, uh, let me ask, this is too problematic to even start this. I mean, a heat map in itself is hugely problematic for so many reasons. Um, and you can destroy that. We are being a little bit cautious about the heat map, a little bit less so because Mexico City government decided to release data without, I think, a lot of, of thought about it. But since they are doing it, we might do it as well. Uh, and the key technosocial problems, I think I have covered them already. And what is the argument? And I hope you challenge that. Uh, we think that this governance system better adapts to kidnapping because kidnapping works. And now we, we did the interviews with uh, the junksters that were involved in these kidnapping bands. Work as isolated cells. Actually, what people told me, not only junksters, but uh, people that were in, the, in, la Viga, in La Liga Grande, in La Grande, uh, told me that the, the heads 
those that te suben a la cruz, so the ones that select you as a target, are never in jail. It's just los bajadores, the people that are committing the crime, physically, the material operators. And this is because they, they don't even meet. They have this, this idea of having different cells, which are specialized to do different jobs. Uh, so this is kind of like using the same mobile cellular technologies in the digital world to try to actually make the plans. So it's, the app sounds cool, but the great thing is to have a plan, a security planning with your family or your organization to deal with the different scenarios. Because that's the other thing. The other thing that kidnapping relies on is that you are unprepared. You're going to take the, the easiest decision. And they, can, they actually have been very good in doing that so far. And they are trained to do that. So the youngsters are trained by making extortion calls. And, and depending on how the, their master responds to that, they can go and pick people in the street. Um, so basically, that was it. I hope I was in time. I'm yeah. not in time? No, 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 no. OK, sorry for being rushing. It was a little bit longer. It was supposed to be a little bit longer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ernesto, for um, that um, uh, nice presentation. Interesting. So uh, now the floor is open for questions. And we have like uh, a good, yeah, minutes to discuss. No, 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 no. There's plenty of time. Thank you to both presenters to keep on time for keeping on time. Um, I, I want to know if you know about the case of these network apps. Yeah. <laughs> was with the <laughs> uh, because he, he, he is very knows that some family that happened the kidnapping use another groups to do to resolve the situation, and actually. There are more violence this group to rescue the the people that who was kidnapping, and I don't know if these apps contribute to make more stronger that network of parallel structure by law. I don't know what you say about that. entender para empezar. Um. So coming from my policy background then, I guess my question is, A, have you looked at where other apps have either been successful or, or unsuccessful in, in terms of some of the things you're talking about? Um, and on that same line, have you looked at other apps that exist in Mexico with relation to reporting crime? And you're talking about something a little bit different than maybe reporting to the police, but maybe looking at that from a comparative lens um, in relation to kind of going forward and what that would look like in terms of prosecution and, and that kind of thing. Um, you talked about the definition of kidnapping, yeah. but you didn't say precisely which definition you were arguing against, because it seems like we've had a few different things. But what I, so what I was interested in is, what exactly are you against? Are you against, if we're just taking it as a kind of axis of liberty and extortion, are you against the deprivation of liberty bit? Or is that what you're questioning? Or is it the extortion bit? And then also, how do you understand liberty in your typology, in your own conceptualization? So you presented that other typology that I, I only saw it so briefly, but I was just trying to see, you know, what the substantive content of that was. Thank you, Ernesto. Uh, we talk about this in Tijuana with Camilo and, and Connor on the, on the app. And I find it inter interesting. Um, in many projects, we can see that they're working towards an app. But being a resident, I'm talking right now like a resident, I would never use it. And it's not because um, I would not trust it, but because it's not easy for me to uncode, for example, the cell phone, my broken cell phone, <laughs> you know? So it's easier for me to WhatsApp. And actually, um, I have never, never, ever, when I go into very complicated scenarios in Tijuana, I have never, ever communicated this to my parents because I know they'll be upset. Although there's trust, I have never, ever, and I will never, ever tell this. It's been actually, Alejandra was actually in London 
And I told her like two days or one day at least earlier, hey, I'm going this way. Can you keep your heads up for me? You know, I'll be there an hour. This is the GPS location. I will be this person. This is my, my car um, um, data. And it's been basically London and Mexico City. And the point would be, OK, we have the app. Let's say I, I download it, let's say, and I use it. What's next? OK, I'm kidnapped. I push the red button, and then what happens? Who communicates with my family, and how I get rescued? Can I just respond to, to, that, to that point? Uh, at one of the things with the app that we've talked about is the app has value for being the app and creating re records of what's happened, but it also has value in getting people to think about their planning and peer-to-peer -peer security planning and, be and being a trigger for that. That's a real thing. And that, I think you said that, and you said it was a prop or something in the presentation. It's very important to remember that, because there's lots of panic button apps out there. And we initially were going to work with a specific one developed by Amnesty International. But yeah, for many reasons, people may not do that. But sitting down, testing it, and trying to work through what you're going to do if that situation does occur, then gives you something that you may not have done before. And, and so the app has value in itself. Maybe you have a more accurate picture of what kidnapping looks like. But if it, if it means that some people have some sort of plan and have some sort of enhanced awareness, that, that is value in itself. So it's kind of an anticipatory technology. So maybe it's yeah. the anticipatory part that you could focus on more. It's kind of yeah. a risk management tool, uh, in a sense. Yeah. But, but I mean, so the comment I was going to make is that that can be exactly a tool to use against you, right? Your social media network becomes the list of people that they're going to threaten next. And so one thing to think about in your app is, is ways of making sure that it doesn't become, you know, if I, hey, I've got your phone, I've got you, let's talk about who's on your list. Because that's exactly what kidnappers in Tijuana were doing uh, in order to, to uh, sort of uh, verify. So the technology is a double-edged sword uh, point. The, the other, um, uh, w one other point, or uh, two, two quick points for um, Georgina. One is, it was obviously very hard to see your, the, the one table that was the most interesting to see what types of crimes are most proximate to the geolocation of the subways. Um, but what was what I really love to see you explore a little bit is it seems like women were less likely than men to be uh, to, to suffer from any kind of crime than men near the subway. But the closer the women were to the subway, er, women were more likely to be um, accosted by whatever type of crime closer to the subway than men. Uh, I, I thought I saw some kind of variance there. Uh, that would be worth looking at um, with a microscope or whatever you need to see that, because um, <laughs> with better eyes than my old eyes, uh, it would it, because it may be that women are you know are approached within the first hundred feet, first two hundred feet, much more uh, they're much more likely to be approached sooner after leaving the subway, um, or uh, uh, assaulted sooner closer to the subway, which has implications for policy recommendations that, uh, in terms of where you station um, security personnel, et cetera. The second uh, point for you is just, you know, across the board, women are much less likely to be victimized by, by certain types of crime, in fact, most types of crime than men. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but, but when women are victimized by certain types of crime or, or crime in general, the reaction is much, I think, stronger from society precisely because it's unexpected or it, it is socially undesirable. And so I think that's an important, um, and, and, you know, men are eight times more likely to be murdered in Mexico. Um, but when you see a slight increase in the number of women being murdered, it becomes a major concern. And we have special categories, legal categories, for femicidios. And, and that's, that's probably a good thing, because it, it's, it's pointing to a very um, socially sensitive uh, area. So there's just two comments. I have a question for Georgina as well. I was very struck by the one slide that had the survey question on um, 
do you worry about being kidnapped or do you fear being kidnapped? I mean, your rates were about 50% for men and women, both in Mexico City and in Mexico, maybe a little bit lower across Mexico. That's really, really high. Um, it, so it's interesting just as a fact you know, that people are living with that much fear of being kidnapped on its own is fascinating. But then I'm wondering, who's not afraid of being kidnapped? Are there other, because there wasn't a significant gender difference are there other variables that would explain why some people are afraid and others aren't? I, I was actually going to tell you that if you, you, you for example, that have a, has a, you have a computer, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, hay una epidemia de secuestros en el metro. It's, it's in Animal Político, and there you can see the graphics much more clearly. <laughs> yeah, that would have been a better idea to say before. Okay, okay. Uh, first, I would say uh, with you, uh, I have a bit of, of a problem with that question because it's actually about kidnapping and extortion. I don't know if you see it. Yeah. And I, I, I just really hate that because it doesn't allow you to see. Yeah, yeah so maybe that's, that's one of the reasons I, I'm thinking. Because extortion is much more common, I think. So. Were you surprised the number was that high? Uh, yeah, I, I was a bit. But it, I don't know, not that much, to be honest. I don't know. I, I, when, when we saw it, I didn't even... After this attending this workshop, yeah, I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, <laughs> yeah. before that, I wouldn't have Yeah, like probably. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So yeah, I think, I think that's, a, that's the thing. That's the part. Um, and about the women thing, I mean, we do in, in Data Civica, we do a lot of work uh, publishing things about feminicides and violence against women. Uh, I do think that what happens is that when we talk about crime, usually we talk about men because men are much more victimized than women. So when we like talk broadly about murder, uh, we're usually talking about murders against men, you know? <laughs> and that is why I think it's so necessary to talk about the violence against women because we know that there are significant patterns and they are different. I mean, women are much more, more much are killed in their households more, much, much more than men, uh, killed by their relatives much more than men, and I think that it has a lot to do with that, with the fact that we do need to talk about violence against women, although it's less, because it's different. So, yeah, I think it has a lot to do with that. And... Ah, thank you, thank you. Uh, oh. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> I think you cannot see it either. <laughs> yeah, but I was thinking, like, I was saying your computer, perhaps? Uh, uh -huh, yes, there you go. Uh -huh. oh. So you have uh -huh. uh, Bulgari to a passenger kidnapping, <laughs> <laughs> the provision of liberty. Kept going up, right? <laughs> What's the? Uh, it depends on it depends on the on the yeah. It's like a hundred. Uh, it, it was like yeah about that. Uh-huh. Uh, no, that, those are like, that's the total, actually. But then we have like the, the graphic, the monthly rate. Okay. So you, you there could see the spike. Okay. So, yeah, but we didn't see before. And I, I don't think we could, well, I don't know. No, 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 I, that would be a, a good thing to do, to divide like in before and after the geolocations. Yes. Um, yep. Yeah, but it's, uh-huh, well, yeah like extortion or kidnapping, as I was saying. But, mm, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, so regarding the, let's, let's use the kidnapping epidemic as a starting point for this. So um, we are here, we're interviewing a group of um, people that spend six to 14 years in jail, um, sharing their cell with kidnappers. Uh, we didn't interview kidnappers or people that were in conflict with the law regarding kidnapping because um, they have the longest uh, jail sentences. So they don't get out of jail mostly. So they have a 130 year sentence and they don't participate in, the, um, in these activities that are made by this Grupo Segunda Oportunidad, which is um, people that were in jail for s so many years and want to avoid that youngsters go to the La, La Liga Grande, to the University of, of Crime, which is the jail. So they are working really hard with these youngsters. And whenever, 
and I, I remember we were making this question. I said, like, do you think there's a kidnapping epidemic? And before I even finished the question, it was a resounding yes. And they were telling me all the ways in which they feel unsafe in the, in the city now. And they were even laughing about, them, about themselves, like, yo siendo rata cuidándome de estos morros. <laughs> uh, so so this, this thing about not knowing and about the way in which the, the Mexico City cartels are recruiting in their neighborhoods. And you, you get it when, when you get the... But it was surprising to see that level of um, the feeling of insecurity uh, by all of them. And I think that's pretty much the case when we did the workshops and, and all the other parts in Mexico City. For example, we went with Tec de Monterrey and at least 14 out of the 34 or 35 students had close experiences with kidnapping. Their dad, their cousin, their neighbor. One of them was almost kidnapped by in a bus station. So, and, and this was the first time he was speaking about it in public, so he was shaking. Um, it, was, it was really intense to do this type of thing, just in Mexico City. I can only imagine what would be to do it in Tamaulipas, for instance, where the narco government's actually working there and they know, and, and anyway. But apart from all that, let me tell you the things about the app. And I know the, that's exactly what I love about the app. We discuss about it, right? And this, this technology allows us to think through its pitfalls. And th exactly that that was happening, that's what we should do in the groups. The other thing is the group is not the family. It can be your friends. The only condition is that whatever you share with a group, you share with everyone, okay? And so you can have a group of your family, a group of your friends, a group of your work, it's not the same group, you have to make a different user each time. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is it's always a double-edged sword. There's no such thing as a technology that is, I mean, you know what happened with Facebook and, and Twitter, right? Mm -hmm. if, I mean, I, I, I dare you to go to a web page, um, look in the Guardian about privacy and data, and there are many articles, but there's one that gives you all the, all the URLs of web pages in which you can put your email and see how many times you have been hacked. And that's a beautiful tool. I'm, 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 I'm going to find that and use it for our new project on data justice. <laughs> so <laughs> everyone can see that many times you have been hacked. I've been pushed. I still remember the name of the website. Yeah, it's like a, I have been big. I have, have been, I been yeah. Yes. Exactly. And then tell you all the references and the, and the data stuff yeah. that is. And actually, you think that the, <laughs> the very source of the way we treat with criminality is about data. So all these forensic uh, techniques about trying to identify who is the criminal uh, start with measuring the length of the arms, the, the skull. So data has always been at the center of how you fight criminality, but also how you become a criminal. And it's a double-edged sword for the very moment in which you share things on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So most Do Facebook or Twitter. Yeah, yeah, oh, use Facebook and Twitter and do whatever, but it's not telling you not to do it, but most of the recommendations would be, well, don't post your location while you are there, okay? There are some basic things, and not everything is about the app. It's about the, the manual, which is a comic that you're, you're just gonna have recommendations, so you can make your own planning, and we're gonna provide machotes, I don't know how you say that, like templates? Templates of different types of security planning according to the way you decide to take decisions. So the, the key thing about this is that you're gonna make an emergency committee, an emergency response committee with the people you trust. Of course, drug dealers could use this in many fantastic ways. I can, I can see creative ways in which they could use this. Um, and there are other creative ways in which they already have the technology and we don't. So the inequality is exactly that. That they have, oh, I can tell you, they have these plans. If the, you are catched, then you tell these, the other. So they have these different uh, emergency plannings. The, that's, that's why it was so important to have the interviews with the people that were involved in the industry of kidnapping. Isn't that putting that burden on the individual? It's already on the individual. So, I mean, if you, you have done the interviews, um, tell me who of the people you interviewed is not burdened by having to collect the proof, having to keep safe, having to change the routes, checking if the policeman is someone they know or not. So the, the whole thing about this, that's, I have a phrase that it says the ontology sucks, and especially sucks in Mexico, because the deontological principles on which we think about individuality and freedoms do not apply in a place in which you cannot trust the authorities. Mm -hmm. And then you're always burdened. The thing is you don't have the tools to do anything about it. You have to go and beg the police for mercy, beg the state for evidence, 
and then you have a double burden, a system revictimization, then it's even bigger. It's not that you're not living it every day. Even as a Mexican that has not lived any of these major human rights abuses, you live this sense of insecurity constantly. We have another question for Claire, from Claire, and I think that's going to be the last one. Yeah. So we can wrap up this. About the law, I didn't answer that. No, uh, yes, so the, what, sorry about the definition. Oh, uh, but, oh, we yeah. but sorry, but just on that issue, in a sense, aren't you then just um, taking away responsibility from the states? If you develop a more, and I also agree with Areli, I hate the term resilience, but if you develop these sort of technologies of resilience, then you're sort of diverting action away or pressure away from, from um, the state. That's the, I think that's a, another deontological assumption, right? Mm -hmm. As thinking as the state is operating and giving you that, that thing that you are looking for, which is not the case again. And the other thing, empirically, when we did the DNA testing, then the PGR made itself uh, present in Iguala. As soon as we offer the DNA, then the state activates. And that's a simple <coughs> thing, because when you ask for accountability, then the state, the state, the, the, la gente de los desaparecidos say that the state in Mexico is like a dog. They only react with periodicazos. So, and I, <laughs> many, that's a common phrase amongst the disappeared, the, the relatives of the disappeared. Juan, well, I, I'm not gonna give names, but and lots of them. No, uh, and authorities know that as well. Uh, so anyway, the, the whole point about this accountability, but there's all these risks and we have to speak about that clearly. Uh, we're gonna try to develop some tools because the same thing that you asked me was the, the director of the, of the correctional told me exactly that. And that's why we do all these different interviews with stakeholders to see what are the, the weak points. But any technology, not even the diary that is not digital has a lot of weak points. Um, the thing about the responsibility of the state, I, I love that definition. And that's the other thing with the law. The problem I have with the way in which the law is, is now uh, kind of like wired is that it's based on ransom, okay? And most of the victims of the conflict, of the war on drugs, do never get these calls for ransom. They don't have way to prove it. Uh, and then it's not all, only the burden of the proof, but also that maybe their relatives are not going to be there for a week. That is really for the rich people. So the way this law is designed, is for those that have the resources. And then a negotiator is gonna get in and all the protocols, the mechanisms are just unequal to its core. And that's why, I mean, there's a debate to be, to be had afterwards because some of the NGOs that have been fighting for 20 years say this is just bullshit. You want to change the definition. That means that the four units that really work are gonna stop working. So there's, there's, there's not a simple thing. So thank you, yes. Thank you very much for, for all your comments and questions and for the presenters for keeping on time. So a big round of applause.